It's now time for member statements. The member for Scarborough Southwest. Here. In Toronto alone, the government is cutting $1 billion in public health funding over the next 10 years. I've spoken to a lot of residents who aren't exactly sure what the cut to public health will mean for Scarborough, both in my riding of Scarborough Southwest as well as the five other communities represented by other MPPs at the legislature. In fact, the Premier himself doesn't seem to understand how crucial these public health services are. In a radio interview, he called the, the, uh, these nurses and health professionals, and I quote, the folks that go into restaurants and put the little stickers on saying it's safe to eat here, end quote. Speaker, for us Scarbarians, public health means an awful lot more than that. In my writing, a billion dollars in public health cuts would jeopardize students' breakfast and lunch programs at 33 schools. The cuts would threaten to skill building programs uh, for at-risk youth at the West, neighborhood, uh, West Scarborough Neighborhood Centre as well as the Birch Mountain Bluffs Neighborhood Centre. These cuts would also mean 130 schools across all of Scarborough losing students' immunization programs. And these cuts come at the same time as news yesterday of a confirmed case of an adult measles outbreak in Scarborough and possible public exposure. Speaker, protecting public uh, people from measles is not a partisan issue. This government must rethink their dangerous cuts to Toronto public health. We all need to do better. We all need to stand up and fight for the health of our communities. Thank you very much. The member for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, I'm happy to deliver a statement on behalf of the great MPP for Barry Spring, Springwater or Medante. For more than 30 years, About Face, a Canadian charity headquartered in Toronto, has been supporting individuals and families affected by facial differences through programs and services which focus on psychosocial health and well-being. About Face estimates more than 2 million Canadians live with a facial difference, which refers to anyone whose appearance from the neck and above has been affected by congenital, acquired or episodic condition or syndrome. Living with a facial difference is something you cannot hide. It can often create barriers to communication, socialization, education, employment, and aspirations, and can affect one's mental, emotional, and social health. Starting tomorrow, global celebrations will begin, for the first time ever, the International Face Equality Week. The main goals of the, of the week focus on raising public awareness on, on facial differences, promoting the fair treatment of people with facial differences, and working at breaking down barriers for individuals living with a difference. Just as we rightly work to increase inclusion of those of different backgrounds than us, About Face International Face Equality Week work to increase inclusion of those with facial differences. Thank you very much, Speaker. The member for Spadina, Fort York. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last weekend, I had the, the honour and pleasure of working at the uh, Liberty Village Respite Centre and helping a number of volunteers from a group called Project Comfort to serve lunch to the people who were there, many of them, most of, well, all of them homeless, uh, many with mental health issues. But uh, it's the work, I, you know, I want to congratulate the volunteers for the work that they've done and that they are continuing to do. And the serving of the lunch is just one part of it. The bigger part of the work they're doing is actually building relationships with people who are homeless and listening to their stories and understanding their stories. And it's the stories that I heard that day are not the stories that we would expect. Uh, many of the people who are homeless there have, have university degrees. Uh, they've had professions before. They've got a blip in their, in their income. They've got a, you know, they lost a job. And it speaks to how quickly people can go from being housed to homeless yes. in, in our society. And the real danger, too, that they, the, some of the staff were highlighting for, highlighting for me was the danger that's posed by this government's decision or potential decision to redefine what a disability is. Mm -hmm. If they redefine a disability, they will drop people from ODSP at $1,200 a month down to Ontario Works at $735 a month. And that will lead to hundreds and hundreds of people exactly. losing their homes. Exactly. And there will be more people at that respite center. And no matter how many meals we serve, it won't make up for the loss of their homes. So, Mr. Speaker, I ask the government to reconsider 
redefining what a disability is. Thank you. The member for Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to inform the House that today is International Celiac Awareness Day and May is Celiac Awareness Month in Canada. And I'm very pleased that we have some members of the Celiac Association of uh, the Canadian Celiac Association here today to raise awareness. Celiac disease impacts 1 to 2 percent of Ontarians. That's over 150,000 people. And another 5 percent have gluten sensitivity. It's often misunderstood as a gluten allergy, but it's actually an autoimmune disease highly linked with type 1 diabetes as well as thyroid disease. And unlike many other diseases, there's no cure. The only treatment is to go on a gluten-free diet for life. Many people with celiac disease suffer for as long as 10 years before they're actually properly diagnosed because the symptoms can vary so widely. And they can, the symptoms can include migraines, anemia, gastrointestinal issues, fatigue, reproductive issues, malnutrition, and low bone density. Uh, sometimes there are no obvious symptoms at all, and if left untreated, celiac disease can lead to a very dangerous cancers of the gut and devastating neurological problems. Uh, we know that a lot of people are going gluten-free because they think it's healthier, it's kind of a health fad that's going on now and a hot new trend, but today, in honor of Celiac Awareness Day, let's remember that for Ontarians with celiac disease, Gluten-free is definitely not a fad, and it's a medical necessity. I want to thank the member for Peterborough Kawartha for joining me at a meeting, and he pointed out that the prevalence is much higher in special needs communities, especially with Down syndrome. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. Hiatus House is the only 24-hour crisis intervention and emergency, emergency shelter for abused women and children in Windsor and Essex. Their mission is to break the cycle of domestic violence through public education, research, and specialized counseling and outreach services. I cannot overstate how important their work is in our community. In Windsor, one in four women live below the low-income line. Windsor also has the highest rate of children growing up in low-income households, about 16,000 children. Despite this clear need, the Conservative government has cut funding to domestic violence services by $17 million. You know, the minister really shouldn't heckle me while I'm saying this. She should be listening. Order. In Windsor, we recently learned that Hiatus House has removed six beds because the province is two months late in providing them with their annual budget and they are anticipating cuts. The Minister of Community, Children, Community and Social Services should be listening, not heckling. This is serious and it's her ministry. Last year in March, I held a press conference. Sorry to interrupt. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services has to come to order. Apologize to the member for Windsor West. I will give you extra time. Speaker, last year in March, I held a press conference with Hiatus House and a number of other community service agencies in Windsor. At the press conference, Hiatus House reported that they were forced to turn away 148 women and 118 children from the shelter over the past year. A recent needs assessment has identified that Hiatus House needed 40 more beds to match the average number of beds available in other communities. Hiatus House hasn't had a funding increase in over 10 years, but the demand on their services keeps growing. I am imploring this Conservative government to consider the gravity of the decisions they are making. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services cannot claim to support women and children while cutting domestic violence services forcing vulnerable people to stay in dangerous situations. They must change course now. Give Hiatus House and Domestic Violence Services the resources they need to save lives, and the minister needs to stop heckling and actually listen to the people in this province. Thank you. <laughs> member statements. The member for Mississauga Malton. Funding announcement. I believe that we all deserve to be happy. We all deserve to live a life that lights us up. Mr. Speaker, too many people struggle silently with their mental health. Mental health is a health. Mr. Speaker, there's one in five Canadians experience a mental illness and or addiction problem. I'm excited to share the news of the funding announcement by the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care for Mental Health and Addiction Services as a part of the investment health care service provider in my riding of Mississauga Malton will receive $3 million in funding. In other words, relief is on the way. 40% of the respondents in Canada response to a survey 
agreed that they have experienced anxiety or depression but never got any help. Mr. Speaker, it is the time to end the stigma around mental health and to do something. The health care service provider receiving the funding are Associated Youth Services of Peel, PCHS, Peel Addiction Assessment and Relief Center, Peel Children's Center, Service and Housing in the Province. To these organizations, thank you for choosing Mrs. Saga Malton and thank you for your service. The funding will be going towards reducing wait time, creating additional housing, building capacity, and investing in services for the indigenous community. To the resident of Mrs. Saga Malton, it is always a pleasure to be your voice at Queen's Park, and I am committed to work with the minister to make sure Mrs. Saga Malton and all Ontario has the resources available for mental health and addiction support it needs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member statements. The member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I'm sad to die today on two somber notes from home. This morning at 7:20 a.m., a cyclist was hit at the intersection of Laurier and Elgin. The 50-year-old gentleman succumbed to his injuries in hospital this morning. Unfortunately, the person who hit him fled at first in the van and then on foot. And the Ottawa police are asking anybody who knows anything about this incident to please call 613-236. 1222 at extension 2481 and please leave your information. To the gentleman at risk, your conscience is never going to recover from this, and I encourage you to step forward and do the right thing and make sure that this cyclist and it's this person's family can make amends and you can make amends with yourself. I also want to say, Speaker, we lost a giant in Ottawa Centre on May 2nd, Murray Thompson. Murray Thompson was 96 years old. He was a recipient of the Pearson Peace Prize. He was a recipient of the Order of Canada. He was a lifelong constructive troublemaker I admired, and he believed in a world without nuclear weapons. And he started his life in his 20s with the RCAF. And what he saw was a world increasingly decade after decade that was becoming more violent. And Murray, your family, the image that you gave me and so many others in Ottawa was an image of peace. You told me once in a conversation over tea that we could bomb the world to pieces, but we can't bomb it into peace. And I agree with you, my friend. And I agree with all of us who are trying to fight for a more just and stable world to keep up that fight. And Murray, we will always remember you. Thank you. Member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Mr. Speaker, recently I joined the member from Etobicoke Centre, parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Transportation in Mississauga, to announce that our government is investing in repairing the QEW bridge over the Credit River. Originally built in 1934, the Credit River Bridge was the first major bridge construction for the future of the QEW, a signature heritage bridge. Its design set standards for major bridge construction along this corridor. Thousands of commuters and commercial vehicles cross this bridge every single day, and for thousands of young athletes who use the Credit River for canoeing and kayaking, including my two sons. This bridge is a symbol of the Credit River Valley. However, over 80 years old, it needs repairs now to ensure it remains safe for the public, ensure our bridges are in good stand state for a repair to keep drivers safe. I will also, also improve traffic flow and help support economic growth in Mississauga Lakeshore and across Ontario. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members' statements? The member for Mississauga Streetsville. Good afternoon, Speaker. Last week, I welcomed the Premier to my great riding of Mississauga Streetsville, where he attended the announcement of our Life Science Ontario Scholarship Program. I'd like to begin with how we conceived this scholarship and mentorship program. Soon after being elected, I met with Roche, where I first heard that my riding was home to Pill Hill, due to its large number of pharmaceutical companies. I learned about the immense contribution that the industry plays in Ontario's economy, the vast number of well-paying jobs, and how we are the perfect place for clinical trials. Soon after, during a visit with Nova Nordisk, we heard of the challenges it faces, from issues with the federal government's PMPRB to the cost of doing business in Ontario, and attracting and retaining great employees. <coughs> it is a well-known fact that a company invests immense resources to train new employees, only to lose that worker once they find employment closer to home and to their families. It would also leave companies to poach from one another, coming at great expense. What a possible solution. Let's build a bigger talent pool. And the Life Science Scholarship Program was born. 
Thank you to Life Science Ontario for administering and monitoring this program, and thank you to all of the companies who take part in making a massive difference in these students' lives. Novo Nordisk, Roche, Sanofi, Horizon Pharma, Bayer, Gilead, AstraZeneca, and GlaxoSmithKline, thank you. And to those of you interested, please call my office, 905-569-1643, for more information. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our time for our members' statements this afternoon. Reports by committees.